Across the nation, typically quiet school board meetings have turned hostile. In some cases, people get violent over mm -hmm. hot-button political issues like critical race theory, book bans, and mass mandates. A nationwide group of suburban women called Red, Wine, and Blue are working to change the national conversation. Beverly Batt is chief content officer at Red, Wine, and Blue, and she joins us now. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. So how did Red, Wine, and Blue get started? What is your mission? What's the focus? Um, and why primarily focus on suburban women? Well, I think starting with the last part of that, you see the suburbs as the only swing districts in the country. You know, if you live in a in a city, you are a D plus a thousand. If you live in a very rural area, you are R plus a thousand. So suburbs are really those swing districts. But Red Wine and Blue got started in 2019 after our founder Katie Paris noticed that we didn't uh, quite have the movement in Ohio that the rest of the country saw in 2018 in the midterms. So she had a mission to change that. Uh, by helping women uh, provide resources and do all kinds of things to organize on the local level. Well, as you know, uh, school board meetings have taken on a much larger sort of political um, a stage, if you will. And there's been a lot of talk about whether or not the, these sort of things are organic, whether or not there's funding coming from organized groups that are that are influencing the uh, the passions. Let's put it that way that we're seeing at these meetings. So I have to ask you, who's funding your organization? Well, since we launched Book Ban Busters, which is our campaign pushing back against these book bans, we've seen over, and that was on January 31st, about $50,000 uh, of donations of people coming in, donating to, to Red, Wine, and Blue to fight back against this. Um, so we've seen, you know, we get a lot of donations that way, some smaller family foundations, but unlike groups like Moms for Liberty that are funded by things like the Heritage Action and, and, and groups like that. We do not have those DC ties. So I'm fascinated by uh, this hashtag book ban busters. As you know, as you just mentioned, dozens of states are embroiled in attempts to, to yank what they call objectionable books. Um, I, I did a little bit of this story earlier on CBS Mornings uh, where we showed LeVar Burton, who's beloved by everybody because he was the host of Reading Rainbow and so has an outsized influence on a lot of young people, who, well, people who were young then who watched him on Reading Rainbow. <laughs> and he was talking about a book like, a book about Rosa Parks that is being banned. Um, books mm -hmm. about the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. For example, Art Spiegelman's Mouse, which is an incredible book uh, uh, about the Holocaust. Stories that his grandfather told him about surviving concentration camps, which he then put into a, a, a comic book form. That's been banned in some school districts across the country. How are you using this movement to push back on that? Well, we started hearing about these book bans last spring, heading into the summer. Um, you know, it was cloaked a lot in anti-CRT rhetoric at that time, right? We heard about that a lot. But at the end of the day, they were banning access to knowledge. And so we started seeing books like I Am Rosa Parks, books like Mouse getting banned, and outraged by parents at the local level that this was happening. Because at the end of the day, what we want is our children to have access to a good education. That's why folks move to the suburbs, right? For the schools and so to have that um to have this kind of well-funded effort to take away the equity in our children's education is is really too much to bear and that's why you're seeing moms at bus stops across the country coming together and trying to figure out what they can do to fight back against that so we offer things like our troublemaker training uh where you can figure out how to push back against these bans other resources how to do pretty much everything um where it comes to having to organize against this like i said this well-funded effort coming out of D.C. Um, you know, we just popped up that map that you guys have on your uh, website, which I think is such an interesting tool. Uh, I live in Pennsylvania, and so I went, of course, to see, you know, the state that I'm in, and there were I had no idea, actually, the number of mask bans that are being pushed, that have been passed, that have been thwarted. I think for a lot of parents, if you've got a full-time job and you're juggling all, you know, everything you need to do, you're not keeping track of this stuff, mm -hmm. right? So it was very, very informative, mm -hmm. interactive sort of can uh, map. I, can, can I just add to your yeah. point, Amory, about that map, uh, Amory and Beverly? You know, one of the things, Beverly, you said something uh, which I think is interesting. You know, there is a perception that you sometimes move to the suburbs because you, quote, get a better education. But as a proud as a proud product of yeah. New York City public schools, I will note that uh, you don't have the type of book bannings here in New York City that you've seen in some of the uh, places you've seen across the country. Right. In other words, the perception that you get a better education 
out in the suburbs or in some of the more rural areas is not always true well, because you can get a good education in an urban public school like, like I did. And, but but to, to offer the flip side, you know, the parents that are upset about these books don't think that that's the case, right? They think exposure to these books are, are, not, are not giving their children a better education. Mm -hmm. And one of the other topics... It's not just race, but it's also gender, LGBTQ uh, rights. Those books as well are being sort of, there's a big pushback. And the argument is that they're not age appropriate. Why are we teaching these little kids about body parts and so on and so forth? I want to get your reaction to the people who say these sorts of books should not be made available. I, it, it scares me to think about books not being made available, but I, I think the what people are failing is that most of these books aren't being taught in actual classes. Mm. They're just available in the library. And so if you want to talk to your child about, hey, don't check out that book. I don't feel comfortable with it. That's your right. And that's the parent choice that the other side likes to talk about, right? They can have that conversation and I can have the same conversation with my child. That's my responsibility. Um, but it's, it's important that children who might not have, you know, every access can go and learn about what it means to be a, a, a gay person, what it means to be trans. You know, they need to be able to see themselves reflected. And when that happens, we see better outcomes for these children, right? Um, so I think that's really important. And it's just it's just leading with kindness, right? It's being able to, to, to say at the end of the day that we are trying to create a kind, welcoming environment that does not foster bullies for our children to go and to learn in. Um, and so we're just, we're really trying to lead with that, lead with love. I thought it was really interesting that you said that, you know, this is, some of these books are just made available because one of the bans in Pennsylvania was against a book just being made available, that they felt like if it's, it, if it, if the children were going to be exposed to it, then they needed to be exposed to it with a teacher's guidance. Mm. That just putting it in the library and letting them just discover it on their own was bad. So mm. they wanted the book banned from just being in the library. So I, well, the question I actually wanted to ask you is, do you think this is just about books? No, it's absolutely not just about books. It's about destroying public education. I mean, we're seeing it with all of these different uh, things. Sometimes it's books, sometimes it's anti-critical race theory, sometimes it's anti-trans kids in sports, anti-mask, anything that they can find that's going to be the fracture point in a community, right, to, to, to really derail public education in a time where parents are already exhausted, to your point, um, and, and are having to face things like figuring out how to get kids to school, how to, to make sure that they're safe, how we don't uh, lose a bunch of teachers as we're seeing this kind of mass exodus from the profession. So we have real issues with public education that moms at the school bus stop are really talking about and really concerned about. It's not this. It's not mm. the theater that uh, the right is trying to bring to your local school board meeting. It's moms that are just trying to get that safe, honest education for our children. Yeah, and when I read that... You know, books about children's books about Rosa Parks were one of the books and, and some of the books that were being banned. I mean, there mm -hmm. are people who were against Rosa Parks riding on that bus and people who supported Rosa Parks that are still alive today. I know. And we don't want to teach children mm -hmm. about Rosa Parks. I find An American that hero. <sighs> yeah, I know. Uh, Beverly Batt, thank you so much. Thank you for having me.